Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the interactive part of today. Um, my name's Al, Al Hepworth. I'm the uh, vice chairperson at FAMH. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel in a minute. Um, before I do that, you know, you give me a microphone. I'm not going to lose the opportunity to just say a little <laughs> bit here. So, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, um, while I was listening to everybody is like there's a common thing, you know, why are we here? You know, why is why are the speakers here? Why are you attendees here? And I think that the answer to that question for me came from an examination of why I chose to get involved with Fam H really. And that is I had a, a desire from within to actually make a difference where I could towards improving the quality of life for other people directly or indirectly affected by the disease of addiction. And that, I think, is why I think we're all here today. Um, and I think it's born as FAMH is at a community level. Uh, I'm not a doctor, not a specialist in any way. I am a recovering person. But we've all got a part to pay in that objective of making a difference. So how do we do that? Well, I think. Getting more people into recovery is the answer. Um, either those directly um, suffering or those indirectly associated with it, friends, family. So how do we make a difference? Well, I'm going to say something perhaps a little bit controversial, perhaps a bit unusual, may sound a bit strange, but how do we do that? I believe it's not necessarily through more funding. I believe it's through the proportional reallocation of resources that are currently out there. By which I mean, yes, I mean funding, but by which I mean focus and attention. You know, um, last numbers I saw, detox, $8,000 typically for a five-day stay. Times that by 20 beds, times that by 365, you've got $15.5 million a year. That's on one detox center. Goodness knows what emergency do. Um, same thing. Order of magnitude upwards. Popular number out there, over $50 billion a year in Canada spent on mental health, mental health-related issues. The money's there. The problem with focusing on we need more funding campaigns is it's political. It's political and it's also economic, you know? Not everybody's got more money. Governments are playing a political game. What we're asking for is the reallocation proportionately away from the acute model, the treatment of the symptoms when they go badly wrong, more into the treatment of the disease of addiction as for what it is, which is a chronic, disease. We can do that. I think we're on to something. That brings me on to the two main things that FAMH is about. Because we're not going to get that done unless we have the first thing, which is education and awareness. And the second thing, which is a change in the current framework, the current model, the current system, call it what you will. Both those things are what FAMH are about. Um, that, I think, we can only do from the community level up. We've tried influencing politicians. We've tried all sorts of different things. This people is going to be led by us, the people in this room, and the specialists such as um, Dr. Wetzman, Dr. Ejela, who actually get it. So thank you, everyone, for that. I just wanted to say my little piece before I introduce the panel. <clears throat> On your left-hand side, Corey Hetherington. You've already heard from Corey. Known Corey five, six years, I believe. The last year and a half, I've been involved in FAMH on the board. Um, but I knew Corey before that time. It's been, it's been a good journey. Um, Lisa, thank you very much indeed for your talk. Showed a lot of strength, courage, but boy, did you have a lot of meaning to people out there? Thank you very much indeed. Okay. 
Dr. Raju Hajela. I'm going to be honest, the first time I met Dr. Hajela was about six, seven years ago in a professional capacity. <laughs> And I didn't like him very much at all. <laughs> I'd, I'd spent all my life to that point avoiding doctors like the plague, and I was thrust in front of him. Since then, I'm pleased to say our relationship has changed. Uh, there's certainly respect from my side. I, don't, I can't speak for him, but uh, I see him as a friend, um, certainly an ally, and has been very instrumental into where I am today. Thank you, Dr. Ejela. Paul, again, thank you for your words, for your journey. I'm sure it resonated with a lot, certainly did with me. It's an ongoing process, it's an ongoing journey. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Dave, Dave, thanks very much, great MC. Um, known Dave again um, several years before I got involved in FAMH. Uh, pleasure working with you, mate. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the process for this Q&A thing we got going on here. Um, there's a saying in AA that the most important, important person in the room is the newcomer. The most important person in this room right now is sat right over there. It's the IT guy. <laughs> uh, Tim, thanks, Tim. So hopefully this is going to work. Um, we got uh, Dr. Wetzman, Howard, Harold, Howard, Howard. Yeah, I've never met Howard, but I must say, having seen him and seen his speech, I got the distinct impression I'm going to like him yeah. <laughs> when I do meet him. He's very likable. <laughs> so Howard's going to come in. I've got some questions on my phone. I've got some questions that have been passed to me in writing. We've also got a microphone set up right there near Tim. So if anybody wants to come up uh, and ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll direct you over there. Uh, I don't know how this is going to go, if we're going to get through all the questions. Rest assured, any questions I've had in writing or any questions that have been texted to us that I don't get covered, we'll try, in fact, we will get, answer those questions through the uh, website. I'm not going to say any more right now uh, in terms of um, the panel. I will be saying some words at the end just to wrap us all up. I think we've got an hour and a bit here on the panel. So... Um, we shall proceed. Um, so would, to start with, would any, has anybody got a burning ambition to stand up and ask a question from the get-go? If not, I'll... Oh, we've got one? Got couple, yes, right? please. Would you... Thanks. Two. <laughs> we got two. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I was wondering, I think in the United States you have ASM which is the American uh, med Addiction Medicine, and it's a recognized specialty. Wouldn't it be helpful in Canada if addiction medicine was a recognized specialty? And how do we go about changing that so, you know, uh, it's a recognized specialty and those doctors can be recognized and be influential in changing the system? And that's a great question and something that's near to my heart. I can give you a bit of a history lesson. The Canadian Society of Addiction Medicine was founded in 1989 as the Canadian Medical Society on Alcohol and Other Drugs. The American Society of Addiction Medicine that Howard and I are part of was originally founded as an American Medical Society on Alcoholism on the East Coast in 1954. So the interest has been there, but unfortunately, even to this day, even in the US, addiction medicine is not a full-fledged board specialty until this coming year. And even there, addiction medicine has been adopted by the American Board of Preventive Medicine. So it is just coming on stream. Although about eight or nine years ago, coming up to, it was 2009 in New Orleans actually, when uh, several of us got our board certification in addiction medicine through an American Board of Addiction Medicine. But that was an external board. It, the American Board of Medical Specialties didn't include us. So the medical politics actually is quite complicated. And Howard is a psychiatrist, so I'd actually invite his comments from the psychiatry perspective. But certainly in many circles that I've been in, both in the US and in Canada, psychiatry has tried to keep 
addiction medicine as becoming a separate specialty. I'm a primary care physician, not a psychiatrist, as I've said before. So I'm part of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. I'm certified through them. I have a fellowship through them. And over the last several years, we've managed to succeed in getting addiction medicine to a stage where there'll be a certificate of added competence in addiction medicine fairly soon. And the specialty organization in Canada is called the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. And there is a bit of politics because family medicine and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons has been separate since the 50s. Unlike the US where the College of Family Practice is part of the American Board of Medical Specialties. So those are the obstacles. Having said all of that, I was involved in setting up the certification exam in Canada and the process uh, going back to 2000. So since 2000 to now 17 years, the Canadian Society of Addiction Medicine has granted a certificate for people who have taken either the American exam, which used to be given by the American Society of Addiction Medicine, going back to the 80s up to the later 2000s, and then the American Board of Addiction Medicine took over, and now the American Board of Preventive Medicine is taking over. Starting in 2004, another initiative, which actually is based in Calgary, and uh, the husband of the administrator of the International Society of Addiction Medicine is actually in the audience, and we have managed to set up an international exam, which is largely Canadian, still uh, being run out of Calgary as the center, but we've had people take the International Society of Addiction Medicine exam, and the Canadian certification can be given to Canadian physicians who've taken either the international or the American exam. So the process is ongoing. The College of Physicians and Surgeons in each province are the ones that recognize whatever a physician does and whether they have an area of focus or special interest. So the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta does recognize me that I have added qualification. And from the College of Family Physicians perspective, they recognize me as a family physician primarily, specialist, but with a focused practice in addiction and mental health and occupational health. So those things are there, but unfortunately we don't have training venues. I would echo what Al said, that we live in a very acute care system. And the acute care specialties get most of the money. People want to get better. Unfortunately, medical training uh, is a challenge. I've been involved with medical schools for the last 30 years, and uh, unfortunately, the track record is not great because of various different funding issues and politics and all of that. That's why I was joking about I consciously quit academia 10 years ago, but never really quit because I'm a physician who's part of the system. I'm still part of Alberta Health Services. I'm still part of the community organization connected with the Department of Family Medicine. And I'm now being strong-armed to get back as academic faculty, which I'm going to do and see if the climate has changed. But I think what Al has said is really the key, is all of you in the audience have way more clout. Because your voice counts for much more than you realize. You need to be able to talk to your MLA, your MP, and come to meetings like this. And this is why I said earlier in the day that for each and every one of you, if you just talk to 10 more people, raise awareness and start a real dialogue, then we can make a change. Thank you. Howard, did you have a comment on uh, the climate in the US and psychiatry? Well, I think the question was, um, would it be a good idea if the Canadian medical system had a specialty for addiction medicine? And I think the short answer is yes. The real question is, why has that spontaneously not happened? I can't speak to Canada, but in America, the largest reason why we've had such trouble uh, as Raju went through is that uh, here don't believe addiction is a disease that requires a physician help. Is there feed too much feedback? No, you're good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Um, yes, second question, please. Uh, hi there. Um, I've been, I'm a nurse in psychiatry and uh, been doing it for like over 35 years. And we seem to be seeing like a big explosion of drug-induced psychosis coming in where from when it used to be like one or two people to the majority of our patients have some sort of drug-induced situation here. 
And what we often do is, like the social workers will talk to them and see if they want to get help. And we might get a trickle of one or two doing that, whereas we're stabilizing the others and sending them back out to do the same thing and coming back in again. Um, now, I know, Dr. Hargela, you've said in your book that people who uh, are forced into treatment have as just a good a chance of getting better than those who go in voluntarily. Um, is there any, sis any system or any way can, that you can think of that we can maybe get more people into treatment, like even voluntarily, like we just, like the resources don't seem to be there. And I'm just wondering, is there something there that we can get people, more people into treatment and keep them out of this loop of going in, doing drugs, coming back and. Howard, did you want to take that question first? Okay. Should there be a different system that allowed for more coerced treatment so people get, did I get that right? Uh, yes. Yeah, just like, is there something in the system where we can get people, like even the a lot of the voluntary people, people who might want to are kind of on, you know, like uh, maybe I will or maybe I won't, and they just don't do it. Is there a way to kind of get more people into treatment than what we're seeing now, even if, it, if we need to force it or is, I, I is the system available to do that? Why would a person who's right line who is in pain and suffering not select treatment? And I think as a field, make the mistake of defaulting to the position that they are not and that's the answer we tell ourselves. And then that lets us off the hook. Um, we have to assume they are in their right minds. Find ways to attract men. I would like to take a shot at sure. just a few Absolutely. things that, that you asked there. Because, um, uh, you know, Roger, you do talk in your book about how treatment can be as effective, yeah. but it's the kind of treatment, too, to that's begin right. with. Yeah. So, so we're starting with insufficient, I think, treatment programs to begin with and that's why we see a difference in results between people that go voluntarily and people that are told to go whereas if we have the treatment centers or treatment facilities as Howard had talked about today um, you know where we come in and, and I know myself I come in and I say I want help but I want you to help me the way I want to be helped and, and, and we kind of laugh at that and we say oh okay well you're not ready yet then uh, but that's not my experience with, with Raju, and, and it doesn't sound like that's what, uh, what Howard does either. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I think our idea of treatment and our expectations around that need to be adjusted. And I think the problem is even one step before that, Carl, and you probably know this being on the front line, that when psychiatric patients come in or patients come in with psychiatric complications, they're basically warehoused and or medicated. And I know from patient after patient that the contact that they have on psychiatric wards is you shouldn't be doing, you should know better. And then whatever is offered is offered as, well, you should go get help. And maybe you can go here, maybe you can go here. And the message most patients get from that is, that they'll be sent to a place where there'll be more of finger wagging. And that becomes a non-starter. Uh, I can tell you every day, a lot of time that we spend is engaging people and getting them to trust us because often they're not trusting. So I don't mean to put it back on you, but, and I know the environment you work in, uh, there are problems, many of the psychiatrists you work with, I know. <laughs> so, but having said all of that, if at your own nursing level, you can start a dialogue with patients, in the sense of that whatever you've experienced here is not what is helpful. But if you can go to places and follow up, even a referral to a 12-step meeting. Like part of my training back in the 80s where we had such limited resources, to the extent that when I was in Toronto at the Addiction Research Foundation, which has been amalgamated in the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, other hospitals wouldn't even treat people with alcohol and drug related problems. They all get, got funneled into the ARF eMERGE. And then even when they came up to the ward where I worked, 
it was the focus from the attending physicians was just on withdrawal management and nothing else. But we had someone from AA come up every day who hung out practically the whole day. He would just walk around and engage people. And it is that kind of personal engagement that I think then leads to care. And absolutely, we have a long ways to go if, if we were able to. And really, I agree with Al that reallocation of resources is needed. Like Renfrew is trying to do its best, but as Lisa said earlier, that you ask for help and then you have to go and wait and then you may not be selected. And then even if you're selected, you're not necessarily getting the best care because we can do better care with less money in a different facility. And maybe that's what we can do. Uh, Koi and I have had this conversation and maybe in time as we start to talk to each other and even shift the focus, even at Fresh Start a little bit or Simon House or other facilities where we have better withdrawal management where people can come in directly rather than a waiting list for a program. That's the main reason why, as you know, HUM has been set up in a way where there's no commitment for people to come into a program. We have a program, which is intensive outpatient program, but there's no obligation to come to that. And we have no waiting list because we can just take everybody in for an assessment whenever they are ready. So it is that kind of flexibility that I think if we can bring, in, bring into the system, it'll, it'll make a difference. May I say something? Um, I think access to treatment is really important as well. Um, at Fresh Start, we have a wait list that can be anywhere from four weeks to 12 weeks. So I think when someone has the desire that they want to get well and the supports aren't there, it's really a hindrance. I think that people get lost in the system, that detox is only one aspect. They may get into detox, but then what? They have to wait three months to get into treatment? It's, it's, it's a poor system. Actually, it's not, it's an, it's a, it's not a system. We need to build a system, and, and it needs to be detox, treatment, and then aftercare. And I think at Fresh Start, we believe in long-term treatment. We have uh, the in initial building that the men come in for 12 weeks. We believe in long-term recovery. And then there is recovery supports after, stage two, and then stage three, which is independent living. And we have a community that we support one another. And I think that to be seen in community helps us get well. Do, thanks, you, thanks. do you have any suggestions on how we can approach patients in this situation to get look for recovery? C can I just jump in there? I just want to add to what's been said and partially answer your question. We can throw it back out. But um, the question was asked originally, how do we get people to uh, seek treatment or help voluntarily rather than non-voluntarily? Uh, from my own experience, Corey was described earlier by Dr. Ajada as somebody who was not defiant or less defiant. Me, I was off the scale the other side of the spectrum. <laughs> I was angry, I was defiant, I didn't want to go. I look at that now and I ask myself, what could, would have been different for me? Basically, those things are the things we're striving for with FAMH, and I think not just FAMH, but most of us in this room. That is, if there had been a greater understanding and an awareness of what, what was happening to me, if there would have been an acceptance generally that addiction isn't a choice, it's a disease, um, if there would have been less ignorance of the disease by employers, doctors, family, those people around me, by the way, ignorance of the disease, stigma, what we call it, it's commonly called stigma, then I think things would have been very different. I would have said, you know, I'm not feeling good here. I need some help, but no. All of that wasn't there for me. I think that will make a fundamental change to what you're asking. And not everyone needs treatment. Um, I needed treatment when I got sober, and I had four kids. I had a busy life. I had a family that I had to be there for. And so I used 12-step meetings. And I took it a day at a time, right? So I don't, I think when you're waiting for access to treatment, there's recovery supports in Calgary that we can use. And 12-step being, you know, one of the most known and, and most used. Yeah, on that, thank you. Yeah, on that respect, um, I just want to elaborate on what uh, Al and Lisa were talking about. We had some graphs up earlier about the severity of addiction and how 
mild and moderate cases can progress into severe cases. That wasn't the case with me. I was always severe, I, I believe. But if I knew about addiction and that it could manifest in other ways earlier in my life and knew what to watch for, then maybe I would have gotten help sooner and maybe other people would too. Dr. Westman, do you have, uh, did you want to repeat your comments? Well, first, let's see if you can hear me. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. This works better? Okay. Sorry, I, I, I didn't think about this microphone. Um, <laughs> I, I, think what, I think you all have said what I was saying, only that um, if we do a better job attracting people into health care, uh, because it is health care, it's not addiction treatment, something outside of health care, but it's a, a patient who's suffering from an illness, uh, it's a chronic illness, and if we treat it correctly and treat them correctly, they'll be more attracted into our system. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to move on, and there's another question coming right now from the floor. Hi, my name's Ida. Um, I was originally a journalist, and as a journalist, I ended up in trouble with alcohol. <clears throat> used to say Ralph Klein wasn't the only one in that boat. <laughs> um, <laughs> I uh, then uh, went back to school and, and uh, took social work and became a, a worker in the jails for 10 years and then worked uh, as an addiction counselor for the last uh, nearly 20 years. I um, really respect and appreciate everybody's comments today and uh, thank you very much. I, um, one of the most profound experiences I've had as a counselor is often they will tell me their story and then I'll say, and how can I help you? And they will automatically almost always say, you've helped me just by listening. And I think that's the greatest gift we can give, is that compassionate and respect and a, a place of safety for them to tell their story. And um, my question is for Dave. Um, I would like to know how you went from being an atheist to having someone that has a higher power. Thank you. Mm, thanks. You must mean Paul. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Paul. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a household that was atheist, believed in science. My father was a mathematician. My professor. <laughs> who taught Dr. Hajela Calculus <laughs> in 1974. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, the higher power thing was really tough for me. And uh, the word, you know, the G word, that, that in fact, that kind of turned me off of the 12-step programs when I first entered recovery but uh, for me you know it, it was it was a process that took probably a couple of years and um, you know just sort of forming uh, my own definition of a higher power which for me is is really based in like the universe uh, mother nature um, forces beyond our understanding um, uh, unknowable things that uh, and forces that are at play that we don't understand. And I have come to profoundly accept that there, that there are such uh, forces, and um, I see evidence of it in my life. Uh, you know, miracles um, happening that, uh, that, are, that are sort of proving out my belief in my higher power. So, yeah, it was a process. It took a while. It was hard. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Thank you. Um, Howard, we've got some questions which I leave, uh, believe are in your area here. Uh, there's two actually which are kind of related, so I'll ask two questions at once here. Um, the first was, does the monkey example you gave support social isolation with regards to the theory of addiction, for example, war veterans? And coupled with that, another one about the monkey experiment, uh, these monkeys were born normal and became addicted due to trauma. So th does this not suggest that trauma can cause addiction? Those are really, those are really good questions, and I, and I think we have to go with the second one first. So to call what 
was done trauma uh, sort of predicts something about other trauma that might be just a conflation of the two things. So what happened to those monkeys was the stress of isolation and then the stress of being subservient. That may or may not be trauma. So if you look at what trauma is in a psychiatric sense, it is um, the expectation that you or somebody around you is about to die or be severely injured. So what happened to the monkeys might be best understood not as trauma, but as a deprivation of social contact and being placed in a socially subservient role. I've heard the theory about everyone with addiction has trauma in their background, um, or that trauma is the cause of addiction. Uh, I can categorically tell you that I know somebody who has addiction and has had no trauma, uh, and uh, met many patients who have addiction and have had wonderful upbringings. Um, Addiction isn't the parent's fault. Uh, it isn't uh, the fault of a traumatic event. That does not mean that people with addiction don't have trauma in their background, because even if you see it as a genetic illness, growing up in a home that's affected by the genetics of addiction, there is more trauma than in a home which does not have the genetics of addiction. And so you come out of that with addiction. Was that because of the trauma or was that because of the genetics? That really hasn't been clearly peeled apart yet, but we need to keep an open mind. Now, the other question I, I heard was about that deprivation of monkeys. And I'm not quite sure I got the sense of the question entirely, but I think it had to do with uh, does isolating people make addiction worse? Was that... Did I yeah, hear it right? Yes, in the monkey experiment, it showed that the monkeys that were isolated had a, a different brain pattern. And so, therefore, transposing that to humans, such as uh, war veterans, was the example in the question. Yeah. Does that in some way explain it? Well, it, it does, it, to my mind, it does, and I wouldn't limit it to war veterans. I'd, I'd ask us all what do we do with people who are caught with an illegal substance? who have addiction. We put them in an isolated situation where they feel less than mm -hmm. jail. That it will only serve to increase the craving, increase the need to use. And it doesn't actually help the disease addiction. We also, as a larger society, and maybe, I don't know Canada, maybe we have this problem in America and you don't have it in Canada, but people grow up in neighborhoods here where the daily message from everything around them is that they are less than because of where they live or they live here because they are less than and don't deserve to live in another place where good people live. I think if we understood addiction as the brain illness it is and understood both the genetic and the social inputs to it, I think we'd probably do almost everything differently in our society. Thank you, Howard. I can add to that. Uh, I'll Dr. Wright. You guys have today heard the statement, trauma is the trigger, but addiction is the trap. And I can explain that a little bit more. What that means is, and this is a tendency in our society to look for every effect to have a cause. And the antecedent cause or antecedent event is taken as the cause. Because I can tell you from my own experience and experience, as Howard has said, talking to so many patients, we do experience trauma in different ways at different times in our lives, especially in the military, as this first question implied. But I can tell you that people do not get addiction because of trauma. I can tell you story after story where addiction was unmasked when the trauma was going on. It just got worse. Mm. So someone who might be living their life with moderate addiction or mild addiction, and then suddenly this is introduced into their life, then it gets worse. 
there is evidence, and my interpretation of the monkey experiments or on the internet, the rat park experiment is, uh, is there that those brain changes can happen, but there is something initially that is not right then that that gets worse. There is no evidence that I have seen to date that says that the brain was perfectly normal and it turned like that. Now, having said that, I can give, tell you two things. One is the human gene pool has had addiction forever. So there's not a single person on this planet who doesn't have some degree of predisposition. Conversely, and this is something Elia Gardner educated me about <laughs> over the last several decades, that when people started doing research on brains of rats, they discovered that rats didn't like alcohol or substances. So they actually did do the experiment the other way where they bred rats that got addiction, that would prefer substances, not necessarily with isolation or not. And it took several generations. So yes, theoretically it may be possible, and we do know that because substances and various different things aggravate addiction, but not amongst humans in one generation. And I can make it very personal. And I can talk about this as a military physician, as a military officer, not being involved in this person's care. But I think many of you, if not most of you, would know the name Romeo Dallaire. Romeo Dallaire was in Rwanda as a UN officer. What people don't know is that he was the Canadian general there, but he was hidden away there because he was known to be an alcoholic. His handler in New York was General Barry, a Canadian, who was promoted later on to become the chief of defense staff. Wonderful people. So as much as the retrospectoscope says that Romeo Dallaire did amazing things to bring the problem to light, and he suffered for it, and all of that is true, but what people don't realize is that he was unwell to begin with. Part of the actions that never got taken were because Things happened that weren't believable because of prior history. And that goes back to stigma, perhaps, that he wasn't taken seriously when he raised some concern, and some concerns he wasn't even aware of because he was lost in his own illness. Even since then, Romeo Dallaire has become famous. He's written a book, and he's, a movie has been made. And not long ago, there was an incident that came in the news, and it went away. He drove drunk again. After all these years, Romeo Dallaire, who's the poster child for post-traumatic stress disorder in our country, he's a senator, but he has not received proper treatment, which is one of the saddest things I can say. Hmm. Not unlike Margaret Trudeau, the mother of our prime minister, whose history related to addiction is legendary from the time she was born on Vancouver Island to the Trudeau years, Pierre Trudeau's uh, being prime minister, and even with Justin, and now she is a poster child for bipolar disorder, where the public record indicates she has addiction. So those are the problems that we are struggling with, and these theories confound and confabulate those issues. So absolutely, I'm glad these questions get asked, and we need to have a dialogue and, and understand what the reality is rather than whatever the prevalent view is. I wanted to make a comment and then ask a question. Um, with respect to trauma, I've struggled with that, that argument and that idea for a while, especially with people like Gabor Mate in, in Vancouver, uh, East Hastings. I mean, those people seem to have a fairly traumatic life, um, but I think they only represent a small portion of the population that actually has addiction. And in my daily readings and meditation, uh, this one time I was reading about uh, a, a cow and a calf and how a calf gets weaned, you know, from its mother off, you know, the breast milk. I, I don't know what the right words are for cows, but... Um, cow's milk. <laughs> cow's milk, okay. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, utter, utter, cow's utter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mother's utter. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it talks about uh, how it can be a traumatic experience for the calf, right? And, and, and what dawns on me in this reading um, and my reflection is that 
a person with addiction takes that life-growing experience, makes that little molehill into a mountain, and be becomes traumatic. A person without addiction yeah. adapts normally. Mm. So in the cow case, the, the, the calf that adapts normally, you know, runs along in the meadow and is a happy-go-lucky, the one that has addiction becomes like the mad cow crazy person, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and, uh, that's really what I've experienced in my life. I, I, I had a fairly good childhood, uh, you know, middle class person, grew up in Airdrie, and um, yeah, I would make Christmas traumatic. I would make birthdays traumatic. I can make everything traumatic. And uh, that's why I, I get confused by, by the argument. But uh, my personal experience, and some people would say, suggest I had a traumatic childhood, but I, I don't know. I, it wasn't that bad. My question for you guys is, do the monkeys then have a genetic disposition to addiction? Not, not these monkeys. And I think we have to understand that humans, like all mammals, including those monkeys, can come to the biology of addiction from two ways. We can be born that way, the way Raju was explaining that, that people bred a a species of my bred a, a strain of mice that actually would like to drink alcohol when a normal mouse would not drink it. I mean, it burns, it's painful, it, there's, nothing, there's nothing good about it, and no normal mouse would drink alcohol. Um, and so you had to breed a, a mouse to drink alcohol. That's one way we humans can get addiction. We've had that same breeding experiment done to us. Uh, I can tell you as someone from New Orleans, New Orleans has a very big history of alcohol use, and it's a very French city, uh, a very Catholic city. There was a, a group of people who came here who were of English descent and uh, didn't, didn't match the ancestral population of the original colonists. Those of them who did not drink died or left because it was just too damn hot here to survive. The ones who could drink and induce the lethargy stayed. And so New Orleans's reputation as a big drinking place is in some spot, uh, sense an evolutionary response to the heat here. So we've had that same experiment done to us that was done to the mice that Raju mentioned. But you can take a normal genetic mammal and induce addiction by lowering its dopamine, and we know there are two ways to do that. Make it feel subservient or physically isolated. And that will work for any mammal, uh, including us. Thank you, Howard. Um, I'd like to, uh, there's a written question here. Um, suicide is underreported. Um, we hear in the press regularly about overdoses and crises, they seem to make the news. The statistics for suicide don't seem to be reported any, uh, any, anywhere near as much. We know through our work with FAMH and with one of our partners, who I'll mention later, thumbs up in Airdrie, that it's a huge, huge problem. It's been classed as an epidemic, in fact, um, underreported. A, a specific question on, on that is, with respect to what was said earlier, Howard, I think by you um, uh, regarding aging and, um, and dopamine levels, is there a link between um, seniors being at risk of suicide because of a decrease as we get older in dopamine levels? Aimed at me? Yes, please. Uh, yes, and, and this has been historically the case since uh, long before America and Canada were here. I mean, you look at any ancient culture you want to name, and you hear about the old people walk off from the village one day, and, uh, you know, then the village has more food to eat. Uh, or you hear about grandma just one day stops eating. And this is actually how we die. Uh, so if you think about dopamine in this way, addiction is really a disease of premature aging. If we live long enough, we will all get addiction. 
because we're losing dopamine tone as we age. Some of us are born sort of below that line. Some of us reach that line during a normal human lifespan. If we all made it to 500, we'd all have addiction. That signal of, of I don't have enough dopamine to attach to anything is sort of how we let go of the world. It's uh, what allows us to die, leave. And evolutionarily, if we didn't have that, then old people would just hang on to wealth and hang on to food and population would not evolve. And you got to remember if evolution wasn't there to put, or it wasn't not, not put there, it's not put there at all, but evolution isn't to guard the safety of the individual. It's there to guard the safety of the species. And so um, if I'm hanging around too long, then um, new, new generations better adapted to current if, uh current the status aren't going to have enough food so we look at it as a pathology but it's actually built into us in evolutionary sense not just us all mammals thank you um, got a question um, came through by text for dr. H um, it's been mentioned this morning a little bit about yoga and TM, and maybe for Lisa too, this question. Um, can you talk specifically about the benefits of TM, meditation, and yoga on the recovering brain? Could you say a bit more about that? Do you want to take the yoga question? Sure. Yeah. Um, in yoga, we say that the issues are in the tissues. So sometimes <laughs> traumatic experiences, if we actually don't process them, they go into our body. So yoga, especially... Um, yoga nidra or um, restorative yoga is we have an opportunity to go into the tissues and open that up. That's why sometimes you'll cry in yoga. You'll feel, you know, the feeling will come back and you'll be able to process it in your yoga class. So I don't use yoga as exercise. I use yoga as um, balancing my mind, concentration, release, um, sort of a therapy of sorts. The yoga of 12-step recovery with Nikki Myers that um, I learned in Vancouver, um, it's like a meeting to begin. You each have two minutes to share, and uh, we breathe after each person shares because breath is movement. And then um, whatever's kind of brought up in the meeting, we then focus on that to kind of get into those poses. Um, women have a lot of hip issues. We store a lot of stuff in our hips, so pigeon <laughs> twists are really good to release that. Um, yoga can perpetuate change. Um, if we're stuck, if we do some yoga, especially even child pose, and just start somewhere. A lot of people are like, well, I'm not flexible, I can't do yoga. We can all do yoga. Yoga is for everybody. Um, and you start somewhere and you'll see, you know, the release and mental health and wellness improve. And what I can add to that is, just as Lisa said, that our issues get stored in our tissues. And one of the reasons our issues get stored in our tissues is because our brain is not working right. Hmm. So the fundamental cause of disease, as you heard me say this morning, from an Ayurvedic perspective, which is the tradition that transcendental meditation comes from, from the Vedic perspective, is that mistake of the intellect that it starts to perceive itself as being different and separate from the rest of the universe. If I take you back to Corey's talk about sleep, sleep is a restorative thing. If it is natural, then it allows our brain to function and process all of those things, including the things that we were talking about in terms of social structures and not having social isolation, but having togetherness. So if we lived in perfect biopsychosocial spiritual harmony, we wouldn't get the issues in our tissues. But because we do, yoga is one way which from the Vedic perspective, it's called neuromuscular integration. So physically, you can get the brain and body integrated, and that helps release. Now, having said all of that, all of us are very familiar with the three states of consciousness that we all experience, which is waking, that's the state of consciousness we're in, dreaming, where our brain is doing something, it's alert, but we are not totally aware of it. Sometimes we remember, sometimes we don't. And we had the example uh, of the using dream that Paul shared that 
because of circumstances that were happening. This was a, a very, very clear thing the brain was processing that you could actually remember. Sometimes you don't remember. Or actually, C Corey was sharing that about the cupcake using dream. <laughs> or we have the sleep state where we are connected to, and in my opinion, that is when we are connected to the whole universe where things are happening that are totally out of our awareness. But transcendental consciousness is considered the fourth state of consciousness that we all fall into naturally, unpredictably, when we feel one with the universe. And we all have that experience from time to time. But transcendental meditation as a specific technique allows you to access that state of consciousness for 20 minutes twice a day once you learn the technique. So that is what is special about transcendental meditation. Now having said that, meditation is a word that has become very popular. <coughs> but all meditation is not the same. The most common thing that I came to appreciate when I came to North America back in 1971 was what people were talking about meditation in the Christian circles, mainly church circles, is what technically would be called contemplation. Meaning you read something, you think about it, but if you think about it, then your brain is engaged. And as you've learned today, the thinking brain is part of the problem. Mm. So even if you're thinking happy thoughts, good thoughts, you're still thinking about it. Contemplation will help you disengage from the worry perhaps, but it won't get you to transcendental state of consciousness and true meditation. The next thing that people have become aware of, and in some ways, yoga circles also encourage that, and you can go to meditation courses, that you concentrate on something. You concentrate on your breath, or you concentrate on your third eye, or you concentrate on whatever visual imagery may be created, and you can induce a state of relaxation in the body. But it is still not meditation which takes you to a different state of consciousness. But again, the answer I usually give people is start wherever you feel comfortable. And it's not that you need to do one or the other or which one is better. They're incrementally better because they're different. And specifically for transcendental meditation, I'm partial to it because uh, Maharishi comes from the same part of the world that I come from. Although I can say to you, uh, I was too smart for myself. I knew about Maharishi, uh, one of my great uncles who was an MD, PhD, after retiring became a TM teacher in India back in the early 70s and he said, everybody in the family should learn transcendental meditation and I said, I don't need to do that, I want to explore everything. <laughs> so from about 1976 to 1986 I was in my journey of exploration and I took self-realization fellowship courses and I did this yoga and that yoga and and nothing stuck, because this is part of the problem. And in some ways, the question has been asked that when you're offered something, what is it that keeps you engaged? What is it that would encourage you? And that's something I can say to you, Transcendental Meditation has that magic. That after <laughs> bouncing around for 10 years, when I did start doing TM in 1986, it was an immediate experience. And I can tell you, every patient of mine, decrease anxiety, better sleep. You get that effect almost immediately, which is confirmation that you're accessing the transcendental state of consciousness fairly regularly. The other thing I can confess with Pat sitting here, I've been around transcendental meditation circles for 30 years. There are advanced techniques. And I was happy with my basic TM technique. I thought, why should I do advanced techniques? Why should I pay more money? And I don't have time. But as I talked and Pat encouraged me and I got more motivated and uh, life had changed and I had a little bit more time to sort of explore things and I said, no, I'm going to do advanced techniques. And again, the advanced techniques are very simple. But because these are systematic techniques that have very ancient origins, the effect is very profound. It's not something that I can describe to you or anybody can describe to you because it's an internal experience. So that's what I'd say to you that uh, Start wherever you're ready. If you don't like meditation, start with contemplation. And if you think that you can go further, do yoga, go do some concentration. If you get motivated and inspired, give the TM Center a call, go to an introductory lecture. If you don't like what you hear, sit on it for a while. Go watch Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld has put it on YouTube that he <laughs> learned Transcendental Meditation over 40 years ago and he was doing his own thing. And then recently, 
He talked to a TM teacher and who suggested that, you know, do it twice a day. And then he started doing it twice a day and he says, boy, all those years I was operating on signal with two bars. <laughs> now I'm operating on four bars. I like four bars better. <laughs> so it is a bit like that and as you grow and connect, then uh, you can enhance your experience and get to the optimum health that Corey introduced us to right at the beginning. Thank you. Tim. Matake Awasin, we are all family. My name is Timothy and I'm a settler on Treaty 7 lands. Um, we talk about prohibition not working and we have policies in place of dry towns to restrict access to addictive substances, specific substances. What other policies do you believe would be more effective in place of a restriction? Um, and then a second part is identifying the addictive behavior instead of the substance, the first step. Aimed at me? Who? Everybody. Yeah, yeah, Howard, why don't you... <laughs> uh, Who do you want to take? Now, Howard, okay. if you can take that to start, that'd be good. Sure. Uh, so, the fact or, or the, the, the question that what other policy um, sort of makes a presupposition that that presupposition would be given that we'll all have the same assumptions that we have today, what else could we come up with? And the truth is nothing. If we keep the same assumptions we have today, we'll get the same answers that generations of Americans and Canadians have gotten since the late 1800s, which is this drug is bad, we need to restrict its use, it will make people use it. Um, people who do use it have to be restricted and kept off away from everyone else. And we will go through these repetitive cycles of this drug crisis, then that drug crisis. And I think you all know we're in our third opioid overdose crisis at the moment. Um, not many people, you don't hear in the media that this is the third time that we've been doing this. Um, but you do hear that we're in a crisis. I think that if we changed our assumptions, what we'd find is that we wouldn't have a need for prohibition. Um, because when, when you take those two groups of people I talked about, one is people have a, the disease of addiction genetically, and the other it's induced by external environment. If we had early screening and good intervention in early childhood, we could very much ameliorate the genetic group. If we understood what caused addiction in the second group, and I don't mean by scientifically, we do understand it, but if we understood it as a society, we would change everything we did. And so then if you had the young people who were gonna grow up with addiction not have it, and other people not have it induced in them in society, I think what we'd have is no need for the rules that we've been making up over the last couple of hundred years. Did that answer? Yes. Yes, did, uh, Tim? Yeah. yes it did, Howard. Thank you. The other thing I'm, I'm hoping to maybe add to that, too, is it, it, it seems overwhelming right now. Um, and, and I'm, I'm trying to maybe draw a parallel between my own recovery and even FAMH. Um, you know, the first few days that you think about not doing drugs again, ever, um, we say, it, you know, just one day at a time. Like, take it, you know, in manageable chunks, one moment at a time. And I know, you know, when we, we talked about FAMH and you go, I mean, there's a me in this vision and mission, there's coach this changes the world mentality. Um, and that can be overwhelming. And, and, and so I think, you know, the, f the first steps we've done here today with you and, and, and talking about a different lens and a different way of looking at addiction and a different way of thinking about it. And hopefully, as, as Raju shared earlier, you can share that with 10 people. And, you know, FAMH would be happy to come and do education sessions and, and help people start talking differently and thinking differently about addiction. And I think that it's important to have the conversation, especially as parents, if we want to change it, then we need to take the elephant in the living room and talk about it. When I first got sober, my two older kids, actually all my kids didn't know that I was addicted, and I was like, oh my gosh, I got away with it. 
right? I got away with my behavior and I started working here and I started advocating. And then it hit me that I share in front of crowds to be compassionate towards this disease, yet I'm not honest with my children. So I sat them down, uh, my stepdaughter who was 15, and Brayden, who has it by nurture and by nature, and I told him the truth. I told him how his dad passed away, and I said, you know, your dad was an alcoholic and a drug addict, as am I, and I'm two years sober. And that conversation changed the trajectory of his life. Um, my stepdaughter said to Brayden, Brayden, you're screwed. <laughs> and, and he looks at me and goes, well, mom, am I? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm like, kinda. And he's like, well, then I just won't drink. And so here's this boy who was athletic, popular, and he went, to, he went his whole high school years without having alcohol. And he was able to weather the awkward social situations without it. Um, being in university, he's tried it now. And he says, mom, you know what? I, I actually learned self-esteem and self-worth without having to have um, alcohol or other drugs to kind of help me through that process. So he has a strong self-worth. So conversation, um, you know, my younger kids, 13 and eight, they know the work that, that, I, that I do. They've kind of grown up in it, so, so they're away. But, you know, we don't know um, if they're gonna have the idea that this is a good thought, but I know that they have enough people that love them and the conversation's there. You know the word like recovery capital? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In order to stay sober, we need recovery capital, which is a support network, family, open dialogue, transparency, um, and the desire to say, are you okay? Exactly. And then response and, and reverence for each other's process. Like community is so important in um, raising each other's kids as well. I tell you know my kids all the time, it takes a village. And when kids come to my house, I parent them too, because why wouldn't I? Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Dave just whispered in my ear that he'd like to say something. I thought for one awful minute he was going to try and use this microphone while I was wearing it. We would like to see that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Lisa. It's actually read right along the lines that I was going to um, suggest. And I was just going to tell a bit about my experience with my addiction. Um, and it just comes back to... Um, you know, I, I call it the reason why I drank. I now know the reason why I drank is because I was an alcoholic. But, but um, one of the reasons at the time that I explored alcohol when I was so young is because I was awkward. And my experience in grade school, um, I was not very welcome. So, you know, you can do other things other than drink, right? Um, but say you go to a dance and you're awkward, well, what's going to loosen you up is drinking, right? Or you play music or try to play music. What's going to loosen you up while well, drinking? Everything, right, comes back to my disease. That's my logic. But um, it's also, it, it is also a community thing. Um, so I just offer a think piece is, um, you know, if I, if I didn't experience so much judgment from other people in my community, um, then, you know, maybe I wouldn't have explored alcohol. Uh, my disease would have still been there, and I would have had to deal with it in other ways, but um, it's just something to think about that um, it takes everybody to recover, um, not just the addicts. Um, it just kind of elaborates on what Howard was saying about when, when patients come into a treatment facility, they should be treated with respect. Well, they should always be treated res with respect, and so should everybody else. Um, this idea isn't new, um, but it, it still applies. Um, I'm fine. I think we also need a language of not drinking. Like when Braden was asked in high school to the other, from the other kids, why don't you drink? You know what his response was? He would say, I don't drink because I'm a genetic, a genetic time bomb. <laughs> and they would leave him alone. Yeah. I said, Braden, that is an awesome response. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we've got another question from the floor, then I'd like to ask uh, one from, that's been texted in. We'll take the floor question first. You know, last weekend I was in a retreat, and uh, most of the people at the retreat, it was a men's retreat, were like in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. And if you go to a 12-step meeting, I don't see that a lot of young people are in those meetings. And, uh, you know, I think addiction is progressive, but is there a neurological basis why 
young people that have really negative consequences from addiction don't take it seriously or stick with it. You know, from my perspective, uh, I like the theory of that you have to hit bottom. I think you have to lose something that you're not prepared to lose or have it taken away from you before you're really motivated to, to take the recovery seriously. You know, like uh, there's, in recovery, there's something called the gift of desperation where, you know, you, you'll, you'll follow the instructions, but until you get to that point, you're sort of in denial. And denial means don't even know I'm lying. So is there a newer logical basis to why younger people uh, don't get into recovery and aren't successful? Can I just add another sort of piece to that question um, uh, from Dr. Ajayla? What's the sort of, and then Howard, I guess, uh, same question, but for your professional practice. Yeah, what I can say to you, Roman, thank you for sharing your experience, but I think it's circumstantial. And you'd have to look at what your retreat is and how the marketing is done for it. I think sociologically things have shifted such that younger people access information differently and they're attracted to different things. But I can tell you within HUM, we have people in their teens come, people in their twenties <laughs> come, and it is a matter of getting them to learn. Now, having said all of that, but your question is neurologically, it is important to appreciate that the brain hasn't finished developing until age 25. Mm. So those people in the late teens and early 20s, their brain is still changing and they're still trying lots of new different things. So they won't, and sociologically things have changed, so they won't necessarily go for the traditional things. But I think if things are tailored to them, it makes a difference for them. The other thing we found is, and perhaps uh, Corey and Paul and even Al and, and Dave can speak to this because uh, we match up our younger patients with our older patients and it works out pretty well. So uh, that has not been a problem in our experience at the treatment level, but I can certainly understand that you might notice that in terms of specific retreats and things that you guys are doing. And that's where I'm a great supporter of AA, as you know, but my concern about the way A has operated traditionally has been a little bit problematic because there's so much focus on the substance alcohol. So that sometimes is an issue for young people. We have had that other problem where young patients that we have, they're willing to address their addiction, but they're not willing to quit alcohol sometimes. And that just puts a blanket no to A. But over time, as we work with them, they turn around as they learn about addiction. So that's why I think as we've been talking about, and as Lisa has said very passionately as a parent too, the dialogue needs to start at home, even before any substance-related issues come up. And that's where we can make a real difference. And that's when, when parents talk to their kids about retreats, then kids are likely socialized into that, and that's much more likely, otherwise not. We have two fathers here that I know personally have had amazing shifts in their sons. If you feel comfortable sharing, then uh, maybe that example will help as well. well one thing oh. I would like to add is um, I, I believe the young person's brain uh, compartmentalizes better than someone my age. And I think that may contribute to, Roman, what you're observing where life in terms of becoming unmanageable to a point where someone asks for help. What I've observed anecdotally is that seems to occur typically like not until the mid-20s, although there's lots of exceptions, and there are teens that seek help. But I believe, and what I've seen even in my own kids, is that young people are, are able to compartmentalize amazingly well. and. Um, it, put the unmanageability of their disease over here and keep it there and function. In, and then eventually what happens is it, it, the compartmentalizing, compartmentalization decreases and the person's life becomes completely unmanageable, which is ha what happened to me, but it didn't happen really until probably into my 40s. Thank you. Um, another question from the floor. Sorry, just with regards to adolescence and addiction, um, 
I lost my nephew two years ago at the age of 19, and his younger brother still battles. Um, but my question or concern is, my sister had no control, no power, couldn't force them into rehab. She could peach ad, peach ad, peach ad, but it, it did nothing um, unless she gave up parental control rights. And I, I don't understand why the system works that way. And maybe you can enlighten me on that. I can take that question, and it's one of my personal concerns about peach ad. For those of you who know, who don't know, peach ad is a system in Alberta where parents can force kids to go into detox. And it's well-meaning, but it's probably the worst thing that could be done because it feels punitive to the person going into it. And then there is this assumption and expectation that after the person comes out, the young kid comes out after five days, then they should fly straight. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I can give you the other extreme examples and I don't know if there are people in the audience who've been through the Alberta Adolescent Recovery Center, which is a program that's been part of this community for over 30 years. Long-term program, kids are in it for about a year. I have kids from that program who are now young adults. And when we talk about addiction with them, and I was, even when I was here in Calgary in 2006, for the first year, I <coughs> devoted a day every week to ARC to help them sort of do the complete addiction treatment rather than just focusing on don't do drugs and alcohol. Even though I was there and another physician who had been there from the pretty well the beginning of the program, we couldn't even get the program people to adhere to no smoking past three months. They would get the kids to quit smoking for three months and it was almost as if once they got three months clean from other things, they were rewarded with cigarette smoking, and they were introduced to extreme sports, and they were introduced and almost encouraged to have relationships that were addictive. So we're dealing with a system that is really problematic, and I feel badly for your nephew, and it is difficult, but it has to start at the grassroots level, and unfortunately, uh, these things are happening all around us, and the only way we can stop the momentum is by doing what we're doing and raising awareness, and in my opinion, and we hope as we do that, then we can intervene in those individual cases and prevent some of those. But unfortunately, the momentum of this disease is strong. We won't be able to turn the tide completely. But I agree with Howard, as he said, ending addiction means that we can have a better system where the interventions can happen and at least we can stop the consequences. And I'm wondering too, and I like what you're getting at, Roman, is, you know, with kids, um, you know, there, there can be a lack of sense of urgency yes. on how devastating this could be. And so if we want to invite them to a treatment center and have them come on their own free will, they don't seem to be responding to that. Sometimes. And, and, right, and that's, so I think that's concerning mm -hmm. to, to us. I mean, it is concerning to me. Mm -hmm. is, and, and I have a nephew at, at 14 years old that's... Yeah, actively using substances now. And, and, and Raju and I have talked about this a lot. I, I want to take him and, <laughs> you know, this is what you need to do. Um, but what I get from messaging is that's not helpful. No. And it confuses me. Yeah, and I can tell you stories. We, can, we have real live reading examples. I was forced into treatment yeah, at but 16, me <laughs> and my brother. And you know what I got good at? Manipulating. Exactly. <laughs> And then when I started having these symptoms and, and this problematic behavior, um, I was like, I learned it from them. <laughs> I blamed them. So, you know, I had three months of inpatient treatment in California and I took advantage and I just manipulated my way through it. So I'm so sorry about the loss, but there's probably nothing she could have done. It sounds like she tried everything. But I can tell you the flip side of it is which, what we do every day, that we encourage patients, the index adolescents' parents to get into recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And change I can tell the you, language. That's right, change the language, and when parents get into recovery, then the kids wake up earlier and sooner. I and think, that's when uh, sometimes the consequences are more visible, because well-meaning parents enable so much, and that's not their fault, it's just that they don't know what to do differently. 
And I think that was one of the messages we were trying to hit home today, too. I mean, when you have substance use and, and, and dependency going on, the consequences are severe and alarming. But I think uh, a lot of the parents have addiction that don't have alarming symptoms. That's right. And so it's a bit of a double standard for the kid to say, or the parents to say to the kids, hey, mm -hmm. you need help. Well, the kid already intuitively knows the parent does too. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They say kids swim in the parent's unconscious. So even though it's not even being spoken about, if the, if the parent has issues and it's not being dealt with, that's why if we get better, our kids will get better. That's right. Our communities get better. Does Thank Howard you. have some thoughts can, on this? Yeah. Can I speak to the uh, neurology of the original question? Yes. Yeah. Please. Uh, so we have to go back and, and look at why this is here in the first place. Uh, Raju mentioned that we've had addiction in our uh, gene pool as long as humans have been around. And you have to ask, well, why hasn't evolution gotten rid of it? Uh, there's actually a, a very good reason why people are born with low dopamine tone. Um, when, when someone found a gene that, that caused low dopamine tone in one regard in America and linked it to ADD, attention deficit disorder, they said, oh, we found the universal key. Let's go to Africa and look in the Maasai tribe, and I'll bet we're going to find the same genetic issue among the kids who don't do well in that culture too. So they went and they did the study and they did find that genetic polymorphism and those kids did have low dopamine, but they weren't the kids who were having trouble. Mm -hmm. They were the people who were uh, considered to be head of the party who went out to hunt. These were the people who were put in leadership right. positions right. to watch the cattle, yeah. people who were put in leadership positions to help run the tribe. Right. And it, it turned out that having low dopamine tone and being unable to attend meant that you weren't looking so closely at a flower when a lion was sneaking up to eat your cattle. Right. <laughs> and so they, there is a reason why we're all different. Mm -hmm. And when you take people who, um, who are different and you stick them all in the same box for eight hours a day and, and you say that if you aren't able to sit still, you're bad, um, you're really, you're really not setting up your society for that great success that, that it could have if it harnessed those people. <laughs> now, just one other neurological point, and that is, what is the experience of the low dopamine person who's told no? So if I came to you and I said, hi, I'm really feeling bad and I need some dopamine, and you said, no, Howard, you can't have any, I don't hear, oh, no. My midbrain says, you're going to die. So I learn really quickly, before I can get verbal, before I lay down verbal memories, I learn in infancy, don't ask, because you'll hear no. And I learn to depend only on myself. So these young people we're talking about have spent that first 15, 16, 17 years learning to depend on no one but them. And we want them to go sit in a room full of old people and surrender. Well, <laughs> there, it's just, it just, there just doesn't seem to be a point to them when we make that offer. Mm -hmm. So we can get them into treatment, but we have to show them what's in it for them. That's they right. have to feel better fast. And they respond well when they do. Thanks, Howard. Uh, I will get you in just a moment. But can I just ask, because it's a follow-on question, I love this question. Very interested in the answer. Um, came in through text. If our brains cannot distinguish between substances or processes because they all impact dopamine, why do people develop personal preferences for, let's say, alcohol <laughs> or sex and want that specific substance or behavior over all other? Howard. I'm assuming you're aiming at me. Uh, I, okay. think that's, I think that's your red basket. I get yeah. that. I get yeah. that a lot. Yeah. So um, It's in Howard's book, too. Let's imagine that uh, you have a dopamine reuptake pump that doesn't work very well. Uh, that it, I mean, it works over time. It's sucking up the dopamine and you have low dopamine tone. But you make dopamine fine, you release dopamine fine. Well, when someone gives you cocaine, you're gonna have the sudden increase in dopamine tone and you're gonna say, wow, cocaine is great. It's just fixed all my symptoms. I love cocaine. Now, if you had a problem with dopamine release, you don't release enough dopamine, 
and you have low dopamine tone for that reason, and someone gives you cocaine, um, you're going to say, wow, this makes me really anxious because I have a lot of norepinephrine going on, but I'm not feeling any better because you're not putting out the dopamine whose reuptake would be blocked by mm -hmm. the cocaine. So while addiction is one disease, we come to it in a multitude of different ways. We have low dopamine receptors. We don't make enough dopamine. We don't release enough dopamine. We take it up too fast. Downstream, the receptor doesn't signal the signal well. There's a whole bunch of other systems. I'm just talking about dopamine, but then there's, there's systems that feed into the midbrain that, that we could look at too. All of those things are going to be different routes to the same endpoint. In addition to that, each drug is going to be affected by social factors. So if, if I get caught with heroin and I go to jail for the rest of my life, yes, heroin's going to be great, and yes, heroin fixes everything, but you know what? I probably would go out of my way to buy Percocets instead. Mm -hmm. Because at least I'm not, if I, I'll only get five years instead of going to jail for the rest of my life. So just because it's a midbrain disease doesn't mean we don't use our cortex to judge what's second best and third best. And most people who come to treatment are coming to treatment for, not because they're using the drug that works the best for them in the world. They're using the drug that works the best for them that's cheap enough to afford and available now. Thanks, Howard. Um, I, I, no, just one second. Uh, time check. Are we hard stop at 4.30? Ah, it's 20 past now. Yeah, we're done at 4.30, so we've got time for maybe one, maybe two questions. I would like five minutes at the end just to do a wrap-up. So I'll take the next question from the floor, please. Thanks. Thanks. This is actually a, a text question that came in from somebody. Um, and it's actually on topic of what we're on. The question is, um, are there natural ways to increase dopamine tone that we, without medication? And then they go on to ask about if that is any relationship to the microbe gut bacteria without a fecal transplant. <laughs> <laughs> Howard. Uh, well, I guess that's me again. Yeah. So um, I know that fecal transplant thing really gets people's attention. Um, but uh, that's, that's, you know, you got to remember, you got to realize I'm early on almost everything. I, I mean, that's not going to be. Oh, oh, we lost you. But natural ways, natural ways to increase dopamine tone, y yes. There are natural ways to increase dopamine tone, but it's going to depend on why you have low dopamine tone. The biggest one to affect is what everyone else on the panel has talked about, is uh, if you can feel like you're part of a community and you're not less than and uh, you aren't isolated, you'll have the genetic maximum of your dopamine receptors. Um, now, are there natural ways to, to cause increased release? Yes, there are. Uh, but in people with genetic, in fact, I'm, I'm kind of in a, um, a discussion with someone on a, on a different frame right now, and he's arguing with me about addiction's not a disease because he's not using drugs anymore, and he stopped by himself. Meanwhile, he's so wrapped up in his righteous indignation <laughs> and that everyone else in the world is wrong <laughs> and his political beliefs, and you can see that the same, he's getting dopamine out of the same the same way. And so um, I think that while we look at those non-drug ways and we see them as natural, I haven't actually found one that no one is capable of overdoing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to start running, that's great. But you got to be careful that you don't become as compulsive about running as you were about alcohol. And, and uh, I don't think there's anything that a brain with addiction can't uh, get compulsive about. Thank you, Howard. I'm going to wrap this up now. It's, I'd love to go on because every question that's been asked and answered in my mind, it's lit my dopamine up, I suppose, but it, every, <laughs> every question that's been asked and answered has led my brain to go to another question and another. We could go on all day, but um, unfortunately, we don't have that time. So 
But I'm going to are allowed to follow up with questions or email questions. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, I was going to come on to that. Okay, we sorry, okay. um, those questions that we've got from people with um, who texted. There's a few we didn't have time for. So as I said earlier, we will answer those if people want to identify themselves in the question, and we'll know who to, or we can generally put them out on the uh, on the website, I guess. Um, in closing, I would like to. Um, well, just thank a few people here. Um, FAMH is all about collaboration. That's where we think we're going to find success. I just want to mention a few of people we're particularly collaborating right now. One of them is an organization called Thumbs Up, based up in Airdrie, which has a goal of zero suicides. We're working very close with them and very much appreciate that relationship. Uh, Mona Cooley of Cool Family Solutions. Um, Please check these organizations out. I'd like to thank our speakers, both the professionals and the recovery speakers, for their, certainly the recovery speakers, for their honesty in sharing, very much valued by people I know, and of course the professionals for their wisdom and insights. I'd like to thank Fresh Start for the use of this very nice facility and uh, very good organization. I know Sue. Dietrich, our organizer, was very, very uh, appreciative and impressed with the collaboration we had from Fresh Start. Our uh, supporters in the, at the stands at the tables, each and every one of you, thank you very much indeed for representing yourselves and supporting us. Uh, the camera person and the video person, thank you very much indeed. Um, special thanks, very special thanks to Sue Dietrich. Um, so I want to give you a round of applause here. So. She's very modest and very unassuming, but believe you me, she put a ton of work into this. Um, as I mentioned, the IT guy, thank you. Tim. It worked. Yay, Tim. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tim. Um, our board members, um, Fam H board, if I'm stood up, but if the rest of them could please stand up. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, last but by no means least, um, you, the attendees. Mm. This is so important to us to have the opportunity to do this, and obviously it'd be meaningless if you weren't here today. So thank you very much. Um, so, attendees, please pass it on, you know, that's the way we're going to change things, pass on the messages, talk to people about it, um, it's not just about acute care, it's not just about the tragedies we hear in the, in the, in the news every day, it's about other things, we heard that today. Please check out the materials, uh, we'll send an email uh, when the slides are posted. So everybody here will receive an email who subscribed uh, and when the presentations are posted through the, uh, we'll do a little bit of editing and so on and then get those out as soon as possible. And please drop us a line through the website or some of you got our business cards. Um, if you want to get involved with FAMH, please use that medium to get, uh, to get in touch with us. And I don't know what the plans are, but I would dearly like to say this, we'd love to see you next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thanks,